Thanks, Justin. Um, I should note that also this is uh, my first day with some new electronic equipment here, so we may have some glitches. Um, so I have various titles for this, but this will really be a general talk about what are the uh, kind of seismic issues in the Pacific Northwest with a focus on the megathrust. Um, how does this work? How do we actually change the slides? Oh, there we go. And uh, it says, to Justin noted, uh, I need to change the background of my slides uh, to make it more current. And I also wanted to emphasize that Art Frankel has been one of the kind of leaders of this uh, subduction zone study. And Aaron Wirth, uh, currently the postdoc with our M9 project and soon to be the next USGS employee up in the Pacific Northwest, um, was also has been critical to the progress. Um, oh, and I should say that if you type questions while I'm talking, I can see them. Uh, we don't need to wait for the end if there's some clarification that uh, would help uh, people understand what I'm trying to say as I go along. Uh, I also wanted to note that you know this general talk is one I developed partly for the IRIS SSA uh, speaker series, um, which I've given a couple and I'll give a couple more. Um, so don't expect tremendous uh, technical sophistication here. Um, and, you know, to me, the Pacific Northwest was a little bit mysterious till I went there a decade ago, a little like that TV show, Here Come the Brides. Um, people go to Seattle and it's, you know, more recently developed in the LA area. Um, so a lot of the problems are somewhat novel, at least on a research timescale of decades. Um, so what I'll try to talk about are the kind of three kinds of earthquakes we have in the Northwest. Um, and in particular, the M9 project looking at the megathrust earthquakes. Uh, and I'll put a focus on the Seattle Basin issues. It's you know, a bowl of jello that focuses energy in ways we'd like to understand better. Um, and then I'll at the end touch on you know, why we'd really like to see the seafloor more clearly because of things we don't understand about the magnitude 9 earthquake potential. Okay, so here's our favorite USGS cartoon of the tectonics in the Pacific Northwest. And I'm sure this is a review for almost everyone, but uh, you know what we have is the North American plate to the east and, and the oceanic plates to the west. In particular, there's the big Pacific plate, but we're locally concerned with the Juan de Fuca plate, a little plate that's coming in under the edge of North America at a rate of a couple of centimeters a year. And this means we have to worry about three kinds of earthquakes. You know, one is the earthquakes right on the plate boundary. Another are the earthquakes are within the subducting Juan de Fuca crust and mantle, perhaps, as it's subducting underneath uh, North America. And the third kind are earthquakes in the crust, um, upper 10 or 20 kilometers, uh, which are result from the deformation of this uh, collision of the two plates. Um, when I talk about the earthquakes in the Northwest, I have to start with our most famous earthquake since I've arrived in the Northwest a decade ago, and that's the uh, beast quake. Um, and basically, we were, unlike some people thought, it's not, you know, Marshawn Lynch's footsteps as he ran down the field, but rather the reaction of the Seahawks fans um, as he scored a touchdown in a critical game against New Orleans Saints in 2011. This graphic uh, that was made with some imagination by the uh, Seattle Times reached several thousand news outlets and um, was a fair outreach uh, achievement. Um, so it's probably our most famous earthquake recently. That's, uh, I guess it would be a crustal earthquake. Um, but of course, the reason we have a seismic network uh, in the West Coast and why we have so much investment in um, trying to figure out uh, Earthquakes is because of the danger of earthquakes. You know, this is the hazard map uh, from 2014, just the spectral acceleration we expect, and you can see the coast is lit up. Um, and this is, you can, uh, I should say, these little symbols in the upper corner, are just which kind of earthquake, red for the megathrust, pink or magenta for the slab earthquakes, and red, for, I'm sorry, yellow for the crustal earthquakes. And all three of those contribute fairly equally in the uh, Puget Sound region that'll be the focus here. And you know, we can put numbers on this. This is you know, the most recent uh, document, which shows about half a billion dollars a year expected losses in the Pacific Northwest. So any given year, there might be minimal losses, but in the long run, we'll be hit by these earthquakes with tens or even hundreds of billions of dollars of impact. And in Southern California, down here where I am now, there's even much more uh, risk, many billion dollars a year. 
And just for perspective, Japan has about double the U.S. risk, um, but it's a much smaller country. So the U.S. has serious problems, but maybe not the most serious problems in the world. That's all background, and I'm always uh, kind of worried to show this plot. This came from a paper just last year from uh, some people with uh, FEMA and uh, the USGS in Colorado, which is the annual earthquake risk estimated uh, over time for the last 20 years. And you know what's happened is you know the inventory of buildings been increasing, the um, number of buildings near faults has been increasing. However, the estimates of shaking have been falling a bit, um, although locally some places they've gone up. And this is incomplete. It doesn't include the effect of the tsunamis, uh, basins, um, and especially the business uh, disruption that follows uh, big earthquakes. But you can see the risk of earthquakes was seven billion a year in '96. I think this was in 2008 dollars. Um, and the risk uh, currently, fairly currently, is about 4.6 billion dollars a year for the nation. Um, and just to put a little detail into that, this is their map of how the estimated peak acceleration uh, to be expected has changed between the 2008-2014 uh, publications. Uh, and you can see blue in that it's gone down a bit many places in the country and orange that it's gone up some places, um, apparently due largely to changes in the uh, attenuation of seismic waves expected with distance, but you can imagine many factors come in here. Okay, so in the Northwest, we're concerned with some regions more than others. Um, of course, primary focus is the Puget Sound, where much of the infrastructure is located in Puget Sound and its extension up to Vancouver and Victoria and Canada have similar issues. Uh, Portland is somewhat similar um, down the I-5 corridor here, and Eugene and Salem are um, also at great risk. Um, of course, the coast will get the worst shaking and the impact of the tsunami. Um, and Hanford's a particular focus because of their nuclear reactor and especially their uh, stockpiles of nuclear waste in somewhat aging facilities and the issues with groundwater and contamination and the local river there. So that's where we're paying the most attention. Whoa, this is... Uh, and if we home into the Puget Sound, yeah, that's the next slide. Um, you can see the issues in Seattle fairly clearly. You can see this dark band across the middle. This is kind of the Seattle Basin and the Seattle Fault on its south edge, um, which intersects where a lot of tall buildings are. You can also see kind of the bright colors indicate where the soil is particularly bad. So this is the Duwamish Valley that's formed from runoff from Lahars. Uh, by Mount Rainier. This uh, university village neighborhood right next to the UW campus is particularly soft and the interlake area with the shipping uh, and railroads as well as the downtown. So our, the issues are fairly clear. Oh, sorry, and I have to mention the thousand URM buildings um, in Seattle, for which there's not yet a plan for how to make sure those are eliminated even 100 years from now. That's a current effort that so far hasn't come up with a plan. Uh, so in terms of crustal earthquakes, you know, essentially anywhere in Western Oregon and Washington and can have a crustal earthquake and even Eastern Oregon and Washington just much less frequently. And these red lines are the faults identified in uh, the Puget Sound area. I think Jay's been discredited now, but the rest, the Olympia Fault, the Tacoma Fault, the Seattle Fault, the South Libby Island Fault, ones up through Bellingham, still different ones up further north. These are all earthquakes that, uh, faults that occasionally have serious earthquakes and are a direct threat to the cities built on top of them. Um, the Seattle Fault's a particular focus of attention. It was only sort of discovered a few decades ago. Uh, it's, oops, so I have to keep my hands off the, uh, uh, it crashed. Okay, I think we can uh, take me a second to get back here. Let's see, don't send. Let's restart this. Don't get instructions. And go to the right place. Sorry about that. 
Okay. <clears throat> so this is uh, the Seattle Fault. It's a zone of uh, a fairly wide zone that has a number of uh, indications of faulting, and it runs all the way from the submarine base on the west out across downtown through the southern edge of Bellevue um, into Sammamish. We are fairly sure it had a magnitude 7 earthquake in the year 900 AD. Um, and you know, if it were to recur, it'd be a disaster. This, this plot on the right is the one from uh, my grad students, former grad students, Kate Alstead, showing just the places that might have landslides were there to be uh, even a magnitude six and a half earthquake during the wet season. So Seattle Fault's an example of a crustal fault that we're concerned with. Another example of an earthquake on one of these crustal faults is the uh, Lake Chelan earthquake in 1872. It's located here somewhat off to the east of uh, the Puget Sound. For quite a while, people argued. Uh, my understanding is the Americans said it was up in Canada, and the Canadians said no, they, they were pretty sure it was down in America, in the U.S. Um, but and a couple of years ago, Brian Sheridan and colleagues uh, apparently have nailed down the location near Lake Chelan through finding a fault scarp that has a landslide that dates to that very year. And also there's continuing seismicity in this region that is probably the aftershocks of this earthquake 150 years ago. So this is just another example that crustal faults in Western Oregon and Washington can cause damage. Um, and there's kind of hard to predict just where the next one might hit. Um, if we look at the intra-plate earthquakes, um, this hey John, plot should... A yeah. question that came in. What type of fault is the Seattle Fault? Oh, good question. Yeah, the Seattle Fault and all these Puget Sound faults uh, are thrust faults. You know, they come from essentially Oregon running into Canada and, and squeezing uh, the state. So thrust faults, uh, thrust faulting is the style of faulting. Um, there are some strike-slip faults in the region, but the main ones are thrust faults. That's interesting, because I don't see the questions on my uh, box here. Okay, um, so if we look at the slab earthquakes, the ones within the slab, you, they're all on, every single one that we have in the catalog is on this plot. Um, and in particular, the three biggest ones are indicated by the red dots, the magnitude roughly six and a half to seven events in 1949, 1965, and 2001. So you can see, although Portland or Salem could expect an intermediate depth earthquake, the vast majority of the events are under the Puget Sound, and this is attributed to the subduction zone having complexity uh, in this region. It's basically draping like a tablecloth over the corner of a table and internally deforming. So these are you know, the most common dangerous earthquakes we have, um, as you'll see when I put the odds up. Um, and then we come to the third kind of fault, you know, red things, the ones right along the plate boundary. Um, and these are often magnitude 8 and 9. And uh, some of the best data, well, the very best data has come from uh, Chris Goldfinger, who's been mapping the turbidites offshore, which are essentially the landslides in the submarine canyons. He can find the layering in the canyon bottoms and date the material um, and get compare the dates up and down the coast to see when he sees simultaneous turbidites across much of the, the coastline. And uh, he's reconstructed the history of the earthquakes for the last 10,000 years that way. And what he finds uh, is that he thinks there's entire arc earthquakes about every uh, 500 years. So he sees 20 of these events in 10,000 years. And I think his best guess is about 430 year uh, average intervals between them. But he also sees another 20 events that he interprets as magnitude eight or eight and a half earthquakes that are almost all in the southern half of Cascadia. So um, the southern half has 40 events and might have a 250 year, or 220 I think is the best estimate for how often they have their uh, great earthquakes. Um, and Ann Trehu has plotted it this way, and these lines are all kind of geographical limits of ruptures. So this goes from one end of where Chris sees the turbidite deposit to the other, so kind of minimum length estimates going back from zero here on the left to 10,000 years on the right. And you can see a lot of interesting patterns, and to me one is that more recently we seem to have more detailed picture than we had earlier on, 
And so there's a lot to fill out in this uh, with future studies, but we do have a good first order estimate of the frequency of the big events along the Cascadia coast. Uh, to point out, this is Ann Trahue's BSSA paper from last year where this uh, plot is extracted. So for the engineers, we developed the probabilities. This is really the work of Art Frankel. Um, and the numbers that come out are anywhere between 12 and 18% chance in the next 50 years of having magnitude nine. 12% would be if it's time independent, that is if the history doesn't matter. 18% would more reflect the fact there hasn't been one for 330 years. So even though it's less than the average recurrence interval, it still means it's quite a bit more likely than average to happen in the next 50 years. Southern Cascadia with all those extra magnitude eight and eight and a half has considerably higher odds, especially if you consider it again has been 300 years since the last one. And for the South, they expect it to come every 220 years. So one can get an estimate as high as 45% in 50 years, but 25% is a more conservative estimate. The deep earthquakes, as you've seen, come frequently. And in fact, the estimate for deep earthquakes bigger than magnitude six and a half is 84%. That means we're expecting more than one in the next 50 years on average. Um, but again, these earthquakes have more moderate damage. Darn this thing. Um, Right, so that's the deep earthquakes, the crustal earthquakes, um, we can develop odds for as well. Uh, for earthquakes bigger than magnitude six and a half on the Seattle fault, uh, there's about a 5% chance in 50 years. And for summing all the faults in Puget Sound, the guess at the moment is about 15% chance in 50 years, about the same as a great earthquake on the coast um, for the northern part of Cascadia, the Puget Sound region. Okay, so when we talk about these magnitude nines on the coast, you know, I feel obligated to bring up the New Yorker article from last year, which really raised awareness of the threat and has resulted in a lot of the good uh, programs to, um, for example, early warning has gotten a boost and we have a lot of attention and uh, focus on the interest of subduction zones. But the article was a little bit confusing to people who read it um, not so carefully. And especially it had the sentence, by the time the shaking has ceased and the tsunami has receded, the region will be unrecognizable. And that's true. I mean, the tsunami could come up to several kilometers inland. And, and as everyone knows from the Japan earthquake, that's very destructive. But then the next sentence was the regional FEMA director says, our operating assumptions that everything west of I-5 will be toast. And that's how they do an exercise. It doesn't mean the tsunami is going to come to Interstate 5 and just destroy the uh, large part of Washington state. Uh, and that led to news reports like this one on Fox that said everything west of I-5 will be gone, Seattle, Tacoma, Olympia, Portland, Salem, 7 million people plus tourists. Uh, and you know, other news reports <clears throat> echoed this uh, misinterpretation, and it was a bit of effort to clear it back up and keep parents from withdrawing their students from the University of Washington and people from all moving east. Um, the risk is serious, but not like this. So just to make it a little more visual of what a magnitude nine on the coast would look like, this is a map of a plausible kind of rupture scenario on uh, the Cascadia Fault. It extends a bit far across the Olympic Peninsula, it's further than many estimates, but it's true it'll be fatter up here in the north and skinnier down by Portland and it'll grade from big slip, maybe a lot of slip near the trench, maybe not, down to you know zero slip at the lower edge. And from this earthquake breaking, we'll see a pattern of shaking vaguely like this plot on the right. Um, where you can see damaging shaking extending a, a fair ways out across uh, the states of Oregon and Washington, serious shaking in the Puget Sound, and of course the worst shaking right on the coast above the rupture. Okay, so we launched an M9 project a couple of years ago. There was an NSF uh, seeds, uh, hazard seeds project, um, and we're combining peoples with a lot of a lot of expertise in this. So the essential part is to have um, Art Frankel and uh, Aaron Wirth now generating 
basically 50 uh, realizations of magnitude 9 on the coast and recording the motions on land and the tsunamis at sea and seeing the effect on the buildings and the bridges and how the two tsunamis are generated, the liquefaction that results in the soft sediments, the landslides that might be triggered, and then seeing how that feeds into kind of the early warnings we generate, um, how to make maps that the public can understand and how to use those maps in workshops. Um, it's a pretty broad effort and it still has another year or so to go. Uh, this just puts some faces on those uh, topics. Um, so we had great uh, postdocs, uh, Kate Alstead and Aaron Wirth. Um, they're both, are, or will soon be working with the USGS in permanent jobs. Art Frankel making the simulations. Um, we have Jeff Berman uh, and Steve Kramer in the engineering side of things, the buildings and the landslides, and uh, Ren, um, Randy Levesque and Frank Gonzalez on the tsunamis, Joe Wertman and Allison uh, Duval on the landslides. Allison's now the PI since I've uh, moved south. And on the community uh, outreach as well as the social science part of this, uh, we have Ann Bostrom and Dan Abramson. So that's the range of people on this project. Um, and the goals of our M9 project were to figure out the kind of changes in planning that would help prepare for earthquakes, you know, examine whether the building codes need modifications, and if so, how, what kind of early warnings might be effective, and how much would people like them, um, and uh, then how do we feed this into emergency response and decision making, and in here there's things we have to guess or learn about how ruptures uh, work in great earthquakes. Um, so the, actually, the, it turns out you know, we, we always like to do things from first principles, but when you're looking at great earthquakes, what we really want to do is be consistent with what we've already seen from great earthquakes. So we can make models that make motions that are either very weak or very strong, but the real constraint is what have we seen in previous earthquakes, and then we want to adapt that source information so that we can account for the known propagation effects in the Pacific Northwest compared to the different structures around different earthquakes. So a lot of what Art and, um, let's see, Art and Aaron have been doing is looking at the magnitude 9 in Japan and the 8.8 .8 in Mali, Chile to make sure that the models uh, reproduce the observed shaking. They've also looked at a couple of 8.3s in Japan and Chile and again, uh, see that the models they have do explain what we have seen in the past fairly well. And a good example is the Tohoku earthquake uh, in 2011. If you look at it from the point of view of where was the slip, uh, that this colored map is a typical plot. It had a huge amount of slip out near the trench up to 50 or 100 meters. Um, however, if you look at the strong motion stations, these triangles on shore, uh, we see a different picture of the earthquake. We see that the earthquake damaging motions can largely be captured with a few pops on the fault plane. That doesn't even include the um, area of major moment release. You can see this from the strong motion records fairly easily. These are some of those motions and what you see is the move out of the pop, first pop and the third pop here and the fourth pop. Um, it just jumps out of the data, there, there's not a signal of this very long period motion from out near the trench and the engineering uh, concerns. Uh, so here's a model for the Cascadia earthquake built on such a, an example. There's a background slip that actually doesn't do very much, but it has most of the moment. And superimposed on that, uh, they've randomly put some asperities in here. And this is the asperities they've superimposed. Effectively, these are high stress drop events. They tend to be about magnitude 8 to 8.2. And you know, the effects on the Puget Sound depend a lot on which of these asperities is how close and which way has the rupture been propagating as it goes through the asperities. So that's kind of the, the picture of one of their models. Um, of course, a critical component is the velocity structure through which these waves are propagating. Uh, Art with uh, Bill Stevenson from Colorado, uh, Golden Branch of the survey, has been building these models for a decade or so now, and they include the subducting slab, they include the accretionary prism, which is quite soft, but especially they include the basins, the Tualatin Basin near Portland, 
and the Puget Sound Basin and the Strait of Juan de Fuca up here near uh, Puget Sound. So that's a critical ingredient. Um, these models are put onto supercomputers. We've made a lot of runs on the Hanford supercomputer. We've also been making a lot of runs on the supercomputers in Texas uh, recently, and the runs are now all done, but what I'll show you is really the results of looking at the first five or 10 runs to come out as they were testing sensitivity of different parameters and extremes. So this is an example of the, the wave field that you would see from one of these earthquakes. It's sped up about a factor of 10. This is really a kind of three minute long uh, earthquake. Let's see if it actually works. Uh, so here you can see the rupture starting. The, you, you can track with the surface motions, the crack moving along the uh, plate interface. You can see the radiated S waves here. Uh, you can sense the directivity, and it's going forward strongly. You can see the amplification as the waves come into the Puget Sound. Um, so that's just to remind you of how magnitude nine that, that happened to start off Southern Oregon in this case uh, might look as the motion spread across the surface. Again, that's about three minutes of simulation that I showed you. Okay, and as I said, the motion is highly variable. One of the conclusions of our study is there's about a factor of four range of motion that we might expect to see in the uh, Puget Sound, depending on the details of the earthquake. This particular comparison shows the three components of motion in the three colors. And on the top, it shows an earthquake where the fault plane is allowed to come kind of as close as is plausible to Seattle. So the down dip locked extent is extending the deeper part of the range of possibilities. And it's also an earthquake where the rupture is headed toward Seattle. Um, the lower plot shows the opposite. Um, less, a less deep extent of the lock zone and the rupture propagating away from Seattle. Um, and you can see the you know, large variation in amplitude and of course even greater variation in uh, power uh, contained in these waves. There's just going to be a lot of uncertainty how strongly the ground will shake, even if we know the magnitude of an earthquake is nine. Uh, and the effect of the basins is likely to be strong. Now, uh, this uh, kind of garish plot here is a kind of depth contour to the bottom of the Seattle basin. And what you're looking at is uh, the Seattle Fault on the south edge. Uh, it kind of extends from Bremerton here down it's the deepest point near Seattle. Uh, it extends past uh, Bellevue. So it's going to elongate in the east-west direction with a sharp edge on the south and more gradual edges on the other sides. There's a basin that's comparably sized uh, near Portland, but it's Tualatin Basin that's off to the west. Um, Portland itself has less basin structure underneath it. Uh, but we are concerned about this basin as there's a lot of industry in the Tualatin Basin, uh, including Intel. So that's an important basin to study, but that's still largely in the future. We need to get better instrumental coverage to have a very good look at the uh, basins around Portland. Right now, there's not that much broadband uh, information. So here's a real example of a basin effect, just to, so you can have it in mind. You know, this is a moderate earthquake. I think this was a magnitude three. You can see a station outside the basin where there's couple of seconds of motion, has some amplitude. But if you come in the basin, we have a, tens of seconds of reverberations and much larger amplitudes. So the, especially at these periods, which here are about two to four seconds period, um, the basin has a huge effect on the ground motions. Um, so this is one of the uh, milder simulations that uh, Aaron and Art ran. Uh, you can see sort of the surface motions and guess where the asperities were that they put into this run. Um, you can also see how the motions that come out of the simulation compare to the GMPEs, the ground motion prediction uh, equations. And it's blue here, kind of actually less than expected for much of the region. But up in the Puget Sound, it's pretty strongly red. And we'll look into this pattern in some detail. Uh, again, this particular picture is at three seconds period, which is about uh, the peak, or at least the basin effects are very strong at three seconds period. Um, I thought I got rid of this figure. Now, in any case, this is the uh, 
if, if you can see the Puget Sound underneath here, you can see kind of the extent of this basin amplification. Here we're looking at about five seconds period. These two major basins, the Seattle and Tacoma Basin, have quite widespread effects. It's amplifying more than just downtown Seattle. It's amplifying about 100 kilometers uh, across in longitude. So from two of the initial runs, they just plotted the amplification, the um, motion compared to standard curves. And here the blue is a hard rock curve. The black line is a curve for soft ground. The dashed line is a, another soft ground curve. What you can see right away is these particular simulations are somewhat weaker for much of the area than the predictions. Uh, however, there's a lot of points sticking up above even the soft rock curves. You know, this is a log scale, so these are a factor of two to four above the uh, soft rock curves, and this is typical for what we're finding in the Seattle Basin. These are the sites in the Seattle and Tacoma Basin. Again, this is three second period. Um, this plot shows uh, kind of the overall comparison to the GMPs for our simulations, um, not focused on the basins, just in general. And what we see is, you know, it appears around two seconds or so, we get a wide range, about a factor of four variation at long periods, somewhat less at shorter period, but they tend to be near what we expected or even a bit lower. However, once we get out uh, past a few seconds period, uh, we're seeing stronger motions. Um, and we think this is due to the fact that the faulting on our mega thrust is shallower than it's been in the events we're comparing our simulations to in Japan and Chile, but we're not absolutely positive. This is beyond the range of most of what engineers are interested in, um, but it is a pretty striking effect. Um, if we compare kind of a bad run for Seattle with a good run for Seattle, uh, uh, with the expected motions used in the building curves, we can see the problem. Um, at short period, shorter than about a second, the earthquakes off on the coast are far enough away that the high frequencies aren't um, near what people are building for. The Closer earthquakes, the crustal earthquakes or the uh, intraslab earthquakes are the ones that would threaten the buildings at shorter period. But the mega quakes on the coast um, are dangerous out around a second or so period and longer. You can see this problem largely extends from about a second up to four or five seconds, and many of these runs have a problem out all the way uh, beyond two seconds. But some runs are not near the uh, levels of shaking for which people have been building. So we're just in the process of trying to quantify this. You know, how often do we expect motions that are worse than people expected? But clearly there's a problem sometimes. So when we look at the motions in the basin, I'll just show you kind of the amazing variety of ways we can excite the basin. Uh, we're still trying to develop sort of a synoptic view to how to um, see how this affects the overall risk. And so, you know, here's the Puget Sound up in the upper left. And well, here it is in an index map with the whole region. So that's the three basins, Everett Basin, Seattle Basin, and the Tacoma Basin that we're concerned with. And then we'll zoom in here on the Seattle Basin for some runs. So here we're zooming in. And underneath here is the pattern we're seeing just averaging almost 100 simulations of this uh, local um, amplification from some local earthquakes. I'll show those in a minute. So we're concerned with this is the Seattle Basin. And we'll consider this to be roughly within the Seattle Basin. It's a little bit generous. It covers more area. So it's going to underestimate the average amplification. Um, but it'll give us some numbers to look at. Uh, and then the purple is uh, kind of the core of Seattle. And I've blown up the purple here just to give you a sense of where the things we care most about are. And so here within that purple area is downtown Seattle, um, the port of Seattle, um, the Queen, Queen Anne is something that we're worried about, and the university and its uh, neighborhood up here. So this little blue box is really where the tallest buildings downtown are, which is what we're most worried about from these long period amplifications. And a lot is packed into this slide. I hope you have a big screen. Um, essentially, what we're doing is looking at what happens with earthquakes to the west in the left column, earthquakes on the Seattle Fault just to the south in the middle column, and then earthquakes deep under the Puget Sound, 50 kilometers deep in the right-hand column. Okay, 
And then in this matrix, the top row is what is the average pattern from a whole suite of events in each case. The middle row is what does one particular event look like in terms of its amplification pattern. And then the bottom row is what do the seismograms look like along this profile that's highlighted in the middle row. So here, for example, if we look at the sources to the west, and this is sort of a proxy for the way the energy would be coming from the great earthquakes on the coast, um, we've done 40 simulations. Um, basically, uh, we've picked five locations. We've done 10, 20, 30, and 40 kilometer depth events at each of these uh, map view locations. And we see this very, uh, kind of uniform and uh, pattern of amplification when we average everything together. But for a particular event, you see little hot spots and less hot spots across the Seattle basin. So you really hope you don't have an earthquake that puts a hot spot right on the downtown. It's always a possibility, but it's not guaranteed um, depending exactly where the energy is coming from. And when we look at the motions, what we see is that the energy has come into the near edge of the basin Dang, this thing, sorry. Um, energy's come into the near edge of the basin and gone, you know, shear wave velocity through here, but it's also excited these much, much slower surface waves. Uh, and in fact, entire suites of surface waves, um, which are generating the strong shaking at these longer periods. Uh, so strong excitation of surface waves by the source to the west. The sources to the south, here we ran 28 different sources um, all roughly placed along the Seattle Fault at about 20 kilometers depth. Uh, and you can see the pattern is different. Um, it's amplifying right up to Puget Sound. And in fact, it makes a secondary maxima up here as this energy comes through and focuses. And if we look at one particular event, again, there's more uh, hot spots than in the average picture. And when we look at the seismograms, we can see, again, the shear wave coming through, and we can see some slow surface waves set up, but not the uh, amplitude or complexity of the surface waves coming from the west. Um, finally, if we take the deep earthquake, and again, we put them on every spot, red spot on this map, um, we see a milder pattern, um, at least for the earthquakes that are the most vertically incident. Uh, for this source location, for example, you can see kind of less of the hot colors, um, but this one actually does put a bright spot right where there are a lot of buildings in, in Seattle. And in the seismograms, you can see the shear wave coming through, and you can see some surface waves. And in fact, it's some particular converted surface wave coming in late that's probably making this amplification. So that's a, I think it's interesting. Like I say, we're not ready to kind of generalize this. Um, to put it together a bit, you know, this is the amplification as a function of frequency for those three classifications. And we actually broke the western sources into a curve for the shallower sources, 10 and 20 kilometers depth versus the deeper sources. because we're not really sure how the energy coming in from the coast uh, penetrates into the lower crust. It's probably largely shallow, but we're not sure. Um, and what you see is this amplification of the basin over the surrounding regions ranging anywhere from two to about five. And that's what that generous definition of the basin. So it's speaking even more in the worst spots. And what we're seeing is the amplification from these Western sources. It's made the long, big surface wave trains is about twice as much as the amplification from earthquakes below, and also for some reason from earthquakes to the south, hitting the basin broadside apparently, in our case, is not exciting the surface waves quite as much. John, I have a few questions so coming in about these simulations, if you don't mind oh. interrupting. Um, no, please. Yeah, let's make this okay. clear. Yeah. So one of them on the, on the slide just before this, where you were showing the map of the basins, they um, wanted to know if the color scales were the same for all the scenarios. Yes, these all have a common uh, color scale. Okay. That's right, and common distance scale on these uh, seismograms, so they should all be directly com comparable. Okay, and then another question about the simulations. Um, do they consider possible nonlinear behavior of the soil within the basins? Um, if not, what might these effects be? Yeah, that's a great question. And uh, um, no, these are all just uh, linear runs, uh, small scale runs of uh, the larger runs art's been doing with closer sources, smaller uh, areas. 
Um, and the nonlinearity um, would tend to damp the motions where it's strongest uh, in, the, in the deep basins and where there's liquefiable sediments. Um, these simulations are just for a generic earthquake with some you know, arbitrary moment. In order to get the nonlinear effects in, we'd have to actually pick a magnitude, get an absolute motion, and then put in the nonlinearity. So it'd both be more complicated to do and it would require us making specific scenarios. And I should say another thing we're ignoring is the kind of finiteness of the earthquake sources. You know, the finiteness might average out some of these hot spots, especially for a big earthquake as well. So John, just makes... going back to this color scale for a minute here, it, these plots, okay. the, the color scales look like they go to different numbers, right? Like some go to five, some go to seven, some go to nine, like, but they're oh, all- Oh, wait a minute. Yeah, I guess maybe I was a little bit hasty there. So um, there might be some variation in, in how these are scaled. Well, let me see if I can actually, I mean, you're right. I think, uh, let's see, so these, let's see, the upper left, up in the middle upper, the upper right upper, the same. So you actually, they do seem to vary from five to eight and a half. So there's a slight bit of, so there is, you know, 30, 40%, 30% variation. So I guess I misspoke. Eagle Eye viewers. correct. Okay. Thanks, John. Well, that's good. Yeah, the better they clear it up now than, uh, yeah. All right. Any, any other questions? Nope. That's it for now. Okay. Let's see. So where am I here? And I just want to say that um, there's similar observations coming out of the Los Angeles Basin. This is a, a paper with, I think, C.B. Krauss and Tom Jordan, where they're, instead of doing the usual kind of attenuate um, ground motion equation attenuation uh, assumptions, they're actually doing with CyberShake, uh, putting the known 3D structure. And they're finding pretty strong discrepancies in, in the deep basins uh, between what comes out of you know, NGA West, the, the traditional approach, and the CyberShake approach. And they're still struggling how to um, put this into code and how even to convince the engineers that some of these basins are just amplifying more than, than they might have thought. So what we're seeing in Seattle is, is similar to what people are seeing in um, Los Angeles in some ways. And also theoretically, uh, some recent work at Caltech has been, um, and this particular thing is a paper by Bowden and Tsai, and I think they've also now followed this up with the paper for Osaka. And the point here is if you just compute the amplification of a vertically incident S wave um, through the um, model basin structure, you get some you know, somewhat alarming amplification of factor three and a half for this, this S wave. But if you actually take the energy that comes from the side and more accurately estimate how it would go into surface waves, you get quite a different pattern and an amplification up to a factor of eight. So theoretically, um, these assumptions of vertical incidence may uh, underestimate the, the real amplification we expect. So there's theoretical reasons to expect this great amplification. And another study along these lines is Marine Denol with uh, Greg Barroza, who looked at the problem of how does motion on the San Andreas translate into amplification in the LA basins. And they've, uh, without getting into the details, shown that even the CyberShake simulation seems to be somewhat smaller than what they're getting empirically just by doing noise correlation Green's functions to uh, calibrate the amplification. So it seems like amplification in these basins is an issue that, um, on which we're making some progress and that might make things look more dangerous. Uh, just the last topic, uh, you know, I talked a lot about the mega thrust here and um, one development we'd like to see is to uh, do what the Japanese are already doing. This is the array the Japanese are building um, offshore to watch the subduction zone. You know, this is a plan people at the University of Washington sketched. We had a workshop about this back in April. Uh, if we had sensors on the seafloor, we could see a lot of things. And I'll show in the next couple slides the kind of things we could see. Of course, this is very expensive. So we have to be very careful to see if we can see what's inexpensive approaches to this. You know, How much would we gain and how much can we convince our uh, representatives, for example, that uh, they should invest to uh, understand earthquake threats better. Um, so one um, the most fascinating example is from Japan. You know, here in Nankai, they have zones that you know they've seen earthquakes on in the past. They assume they're locked and loading for the next event. But they're also seeing a lot of tremor. They're seeing kind of 
migrations of tremor that correlates between regions. You know, the Congo Channel is the most famous one with uh, slow slip episodes, tremor, um, and shallow uh, slow slip and LFEs. So right now we don't have enough instrumentation to get a good look at the Cascadia offshore. Um, another example is from Costa Rica where they have carefully monitored the tremor and slow slip and were able to highlight where they thought the next earthquake would be and that it was due a few years ago. And they actually did see an earthquake. It filled just part of where they'd identified as locked and uh, this a deeper part of the shallower part of the subduction interface. Maybe it's still locked or maybe it's gonna go in a slow slip episode, but they've gotten a lot more insight into what's likely to happen by watching uh, the slow slip. Another motivation to have geodesy on the seafloor as well as seismology. Um, and then of course the Tohoku earthquake in 2011 had you know, the magnitude 734 shock a couple of days before followed by migrating seismicity patterns and inferences of another magnitude 7.3's worth of slow slip leading up to the magnitude 9, which wasn't recognized at the time of the Tohoku earthquake, but is a large part of the motivation for putting out that uh, impressive uh, seafloor instrumentation whose cartoon I showed a minute ago. Um, and finally, in you know, a theoretical modeling, you know, is it's hard to know just what will really show up, but there are models that predict that if we watch the uh, deformation around the subduction zone carefully, we'll see changes as the time toward a greater earthquake approaches, uh, either tremor getting more frequent uh, or more large slow slip episodes that uh, come infrequently enough, we, we don't yet know to expect them. Um, so changes over the earthquake cycle are another target for what we could see if we had the appropriate instrumentation. Uh, so just a final note, you know, one of the challenges of the Northwest is the level of seismicity. And, you know, I feel like I've shown this plot a lot already, but uh, the point is when uh, Paul Bowden and I came to the UW in 2006, you know, well, I always say we were promised a magnitude five every year. And, uh, you know, you can see that that was true, um, at least above magnitude 4.8. You can also see that up to the present, the biggest earthquake we've had within Oregon and Washington has been a 4.8. It's been very quiet for a decade. Um, and this just shows the map of earthquakes bigger than 4.6. And in the previous 16 years, you can see earthquakes under Seattle, Portland, uh, down in south, southwest Oregon. Um, and in the eight years following, you know, admittedly a shorter time interval, it's just nothing. You know, this looks encouraging. But um, this is actually in the most remote corner of uh, <clears throat> Nevada. There's nobody who lives within miles of here. So it's basically been very quiet. So that's a challenge to keep people uh, aware of what they should be doing to protect themselves from earthquakes. So just to review what I, I've tried to say here, you know, for the Northwest it has all kinds of interesting problems, um, but there are three main earthquake threats that have been identified and quantified but a lot still remains to uh, pin down. I only mentioned it briefly. No, I guess um, I did mention it for a while. The one issue is going to be that the strong motion in the basins is going to last longer and is stronger than many of the current uh, codes have been designed for, and we need to see how much action is taken to uh, remediate that. Um, how do we focus attention when there haven't been many earthquakes for a few years? Um, then this is the one I didn't really dwell on, but in Seattle, there's not a plan to get rid of those URM buildings. All the other big cities in the West Coast are further along or much further along in either getting rid of the buildings or at least knowing by what year they will be uh, eliminated. And finally, if we can get some instrumentation permanently offshore, we can get a better idea of what our threat of the uh, great earthquakes on the coast uh, is likely to be. So that's, that's it. I'm done. Great. Thanks much, John. That was a fabulous, fabulous talk. Um, if folks have questions, uh, please feel free to start sending those in now, and I will, I will give, put those to John to answer. Um, one question I had, just kind of taking off of this point about the buildings in Seattle, uh, there's a lot of new high-rise buildings going up in Seattle right now, and they're likely to be there for many years to come. Um, are there any are, are these buildings that they're building today uh, being built to what you would consider safe building codes relative to the hazards that are they're likely to experience over the next hundred or so years? 
Well, I guess I should say I'm glad you I, you asked me that, or I guess I'm not glad you asked me that. I mean, I'm not an engineer, <laughs> so I, I don't really want to be on record about what is and isn't safe. Sure, okay. I think it's true that, that people have uh, they're paying careful attention to what levels of shaking and durations of shaking, and you know, with respect to liquefaction as well as with respect to building the tall buildings. Uh, and some of the ideas are changing. Um, I'd have to let an engineer address, you know, with all, I shouldn't call them fudge factors they have in their code and all the different processes they have for uh, designing different buildings. But it's clear that um, the numbers that are coming out of this analysis matter and may affect the, the building practice. One more thing on the buildings. Um, we had a comment come in. That's a, a good point. We should um, define what URM is. So these are unreinforced masonry buildings that when John mentioned that a few times during the talk, but um, just so folks are, are clear on what that stands for. Uh, let's see. Yeah, okay. just to, oh, okay. sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say, in URM buildings, basically anything built before a certain date, uh, they didn't know enough to put steel in the buildings. And if they, they're masonry and they're not reinforced, that's just a very weak structure. Mm -hmm. And any old city in the West Coast uh, has that problem to deal with. Okay, a uh, question here, let's see, for offshore Cascadia modeling, has anyone coupled that with tsunami modeling and provided detailed recommendations as to what can be done to mitigate the tsunami-related risk? Yeah, there are a lot of people working on tsunami risk, and uh, I guess the center of it's down in Oregon with, you know, Oregon State and... Um, uh, so they, they do, they make scenarios, they have catalogs of earthquakes that they need to worry about. And, you know, of course, the issue with tsunamis is, you know, how big an asperity do you put in your particular earthquake and how close is it to the trench? Because, you know, the shallow asperities are much better at making a big wave than a deep asperity. Um, and then Japan kind of reset everyone's ex expectations about how much ex motion you could have shallow in the subduction zone. So it's really a game of what's the plausible set of earthquakes to expect uh, in terms of their tsunamis. And uh, I guess I'll say a lot of people are, are looking at that and uh, we don't see anything that we've been working on that really changes the uh, ideas about the risk along the Pacific Northwest coast. Okay, another question. Uh, could you compare and contrast uh, briefly the approach of Seattle with Vancouver, BC? Are the Canadians taking um, a different approach in terms of uh, their their preparation for uh, for a, a large earthquake in the northwest. Oh, that's a very general question, and and I don't know much about Vancouver, and I have to say that the point of view in the Pacific Northwest, you know, a lot of the, I mean, the people are very educated about geology. They, you know, the, my taxi driver when I first showed up to take the job in Seattle knew more than I did about the volcanoes, and so I, I didn't admit what job I was going to. Um, so they had to population is pretty educated, but they still have a lot of blind spots, especially calibrating what's the danger of a big earthquake. You know, is it going to kill everybody or is the scientists, you know, fear mongering or, or what? It's very hard to calibrate the public anywhere. Um, in terms of the public official, I find they're very informed, but they're, they're pulled in so many directions that they just haven't been able to make a plan for some of the things they should do, like the URMs. Um, but they are very educated and they, they're helpful in publicizing the risk and um, so there's, there's an active earthquake mitigation community in the Northwest. Uh, maybe a related question. How has the lack of reminder earthquakes hindered efforts to make improvements, such as addressing unreinforced uh, masonry building codes? Well, that's that's exactly the right. You know, with Nisqually earthquake, and people see some bricks falling and realize <clears throat> that that wasn't a very big earthquake. Um, we expect far bigger earthquakes than that uh, occasionally. Um, without the earthquakes, people tend to forget. Um, and, you know, as a seismologist, I mean, I always want to see preparations for earthquakes. I mean, Seattle, like any big city, has lots of problems, and Washington does not have an income tax. So a lot of the difference between Washington and California is that, that there's not much money to spend in the, in the government in Washington, and they're very well focused on the problems of the kind of underprivileged and um, immigration and uh, crime and uh, earthquakes are an issue, but it's hard for them to climb the priority list uh, in Seattle, especially given, as you say, the uh, lack of recent earthquakes. I had a question about uh, new progress in numerical simulation approaches. 
Can you speak at all to how they're being refined in terms of algorithms or new data? Uh, yeah, well, you know, now here in Skek, we're kind of in the in the heartland of uh, modeling of earthquakes. With you know, Southern California has you know the best basin models and you know, the most codes and runs the biggest uh, suites of simulations to estimate the risk. You know, in Seattle, um, part of the issue is that the models are essentially constructed by just a couple of people. Um, and compounded by the problem that there's not much broadband data, for example, across the Seattle Basin. So even if when we have a model, it's hard to test. Um, so we, we need more broadband data from the Northwest to understand just what the basin structure is, especially given what I showed you about how the motions in the basin is not very regular. Um, and the basin edges are probably critical in how the energy is excited. and um, large parts of the basin just aren't well mapped at all. So, you know, the, the limitations are in how much geology we know, as well as kind of the difficulty of uh, anyone outside, perhaps a skeck of getting this uh, large amounts of computer time necessary to run sort of a couple hundred scenario earthquakes to figure out what the real risk for the next 50 years is. Great. Well, we've we've uh, reached an hour, so I think I'll, we'll go ahead and end it there. But I uh, wanted to take a moment to thank John again for giving a, a wonderful talk. And thanks to everybody else for, for tuning in today. Again, you can uh, catch this webinar on our uh, YouTube channel if you'd like to watch it again later. So thanks for thanks for joining us. Yeah, thanks for inviting me.